meaning or function. So when you think of form, that's like your word for word. Um, so, the, so if we think of form, it's kind of like, you know, the King James Version is very close to word for word. But the problem with that is that you give a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old, or even people today a King James Version, and uh, they've got no idea what it means yeah. because it's, it's closest to the form, but it doesn't bring across the meaning. Do we get that? Yeah. And so meaning is getting the language from the Bible across into our language today. Yeah. So we've got form and meaning, and they're the two things that, uh, that they take across when translating the text. Um, so that, that's what you have to consider. Uh, personally, when I, when I study the Bible, I like to go right in the middle. So if we think of form and then meaning, and so in the center, that's a very good place to be. Uh, so I read, so translations like the NIV, um, New Living Translation, uh, also the English Standard Version, that's more closer to form, but uh, it's still understandable. Um, it's not like the King James where you've got no idea what it's saying. Thou so, has no idea what you're right. saying. Oh. Um, so yeah, so I would say if you're choosing a translation, that there is no translation that's better in meaning. You know, they're, they're all very similar unless you're getting, you know, you've got the Passion Translation, which is very, uh, which goes very far from the form. Um, and so that's still a, a great translation. But I would say in studying the word, it's great to go in the middle. Do we get that? So, um, you know, New American Standard Bible, NIV, New Living Translation, they're, they're, all, they're all great. So that's something I would go for. Just, uh, just get a Bible that makes the word come alive for you. <laughs> That's the best thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Hope what that it, helps. What are you, just a quick question, not scheduled. What which uh, which translation do you tend to go to <laughs> the most? So I was, so when I'm um, when I'm just doing my daily devotions, I have an NIV Bible. Um, but when I you know, when I really study the text, I like to go from a couple of different translations. So NIV um, and the New Living Translation, they're the two that I go to for study. And what about you, Pastor Andrew? Not the NIV. <laughs> <laughs> Just there any. Uh, I use the NASB because uh, that's probably one of the most accurate translations. It's a little bit hard to read for some. And I like the voice translation as well. It's a great translation. Awesome. There you go. Voice, NASB, NIV. Go and find one. Um, Andrew. I do like the NIV. I was just joking. <laughs> NIV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what is, next question, what is the purpose of commentaries and how do I best use them? It's a very good question. Uh, I love commentaries. I'd often go into Kurong and I don't know if you've been to Kurong in Blackburn, but there's a whole back row of commentaries. And so it was like a, um, it, I know this sounds strange, but it was like a day out for me. I'd go down to the, the back of Kurong and go through all the commentaries and just find out what worked best for me. I'd have a, a scripture I'd have in mind and I'd go and begin to research commentary. So I've got all sorts of commentaries. I've got commentaries from evangelicals, some from a Jewish background, um, some that are based in the 1800s. Uh, one of my favourite was uh, A.W. Pink that I used, which is a free commentary online. Um, I've even got commentaries that are written by people that are anti-Holy Spirit, anti-Pentecostal. In fact, some of my favourite Bible teachers have a really different view on a lot of things uh, spirit-related to me. Uh, Ray Stedman was one, an amazing uh, teacher of the Word, but just had a few things that were a little bit different to me. So I use commentaries to to fill in the missing gaps that I had, areas that I was weak in, I'd find someone that was really great. So I, I was never afraid of reading from people that there were areas that I disagreed with. I could just, you know, eat the meat and spit out the bones. And so uh, I've made that a lifelong thing to read across the, the board. Uh, one of the best commentaries for me is um, Andrew Womack. He's got a a, a commentary online that you can access. I think it's $120 and it gives you access to all his notes and it's updated monthly. And so I use commentaries just to fill in the missing pieces. There's areas that I'm good in, areas that I'm a little bit weak in. So I particularly look for those areas that I'm weak in and begin to read up on those. So the purpose of commentaries is just to 
to fill in the missing pieces, the background, to bring a different perspective. So as I'm reading the text, I, I, I want to get my own revelation, but I know that I don't need to rebuild everything and come up with all my own ideas. There's some amazing revelation. So I did a series on the tabernacle, and A.W. Pink was my go-to man. Um, he knows the tabernacle as well as anyone. And so um, don't be afraid to use commentaries because they will, they will make some scriptures come alive that you just can't make sense of. <laughs> Next question for Dean. <laughs> how should I uh, how should I find a verse to read and where should I start reading that's a very good question um, firstly we always approach the word as we want to encounter God and we want to be transformed so that's how we approach the word so when you consider that to if it's just a daily reading um, you know that's that's very important I'm approaching God's word as I want to be transformed and so when you think about that, you've got to be honest with where you're at. You know, Paul says to the church in Corinth, I couldn't give you spiritual meat because you weren't ready for it. Yeah. Meaning I couldn't unlock the real mysteries of the kingdom to you yet because you, you weren't as mature in your understanding of God. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you've got to look at where you're at personally. Do I need spiritual milk or meat per se? So mm -hmm. do I need to just read the simple stuff today or do I really want to go into, you know, a real study of the kingdom? Um, so firstly, you get that. If you want to go into a real study, you can, you know, you can read the word in, in topics, which a lot of people do, you know, on the work of Jesus, then on identity, then on, on the Old Testament law, but that can be a bit boring. Um, so personally, when I read the word, I, I come to it and I say, okay, what attitudes in my mind need to change today? Because Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 4 that we need to be renewed by the spirit of our minds. And that, that word spirit is actually, in the Greek, is better translated attitudes. Mm. So it's the attitude of your mind, and that mind is interchangeable for heart. It's the same Greek word, cardia. So, um, so we need to be renewed in the attitudes of our heart. And so you approach the word, what, what attitudes do I need to change today? Think about that. Um, is there areas that, you know, am I seeing God as a loving father? Um, am I seeing him as my healer, as my, you know, as my provider? If I don't have a good attitude towards that, then they're the scriptures I need to read today. And so, you know, it's really simple. People can over, overthink things, but I, I literally sometimes just go on Google. Google's good for this. And you can type in healing scriptures or you can type in um, scriptures on God's love. And you can really go into that because if you don't know the word very well, then it can be hard straight off to know where those scriptures are. So I would recommend doing that. What attitudes in me need to change today? And then you can just get a scripture or a passage on that. Um, also, if you think about Paul talks in Acts chapter 20 about that the word of his grace, so the word of God, it builds us up so that we can uh, possess our inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important as well. What attitudes need to change in me? And what areas in my life need to be built up? You know, maybe you need to be built up in, um, in God's provision. Maybe you need to be built up in your identity as a son or daughter. Um, what, what areas in my soul need refreshing today? There's no point you being down in the dumps about, you know, um, about your health and then going and reading Genesis or something like that. So yeah. you, you get that? Yeah. So it's important that we, we analyse ourselves before we go to read God's Word. Um, where do I need to be transformed? What areas in my soul need to be built up today? Uh, they're probably yeah. the two main things um, yeah, hopefully yeah. it helps. Focusing on areas where we need to develop yeah, ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And it's yeah. like training for something. You That's know, right. if you're going to do a marathon, there's no point, you know, swimming 100%. or like yeah. doing a pie eating contest. <laughs> no. Focus on the Don't areas that. that you need strength. That's right. Can yep. I just back up what Dean said? What he said was really, really profound. One of the things I do, uh, adding to what Dean said, is I medicate myself with the Psalms. So particularly when I'm emotionally low, uh, David, the psalmist, he, he covers nearly all, or he does, he covers all the emotions in the psalms. So I go and look for somewhere where he's feeling like I am because by the end of the psalm he's given a remedy. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we use the word for all those ways and, and particularly emotionally, that's where I head to when I'm feeling flat. That's awesome. And that kind of leads probably quite nicely into our next question. How do I use my Bible effectively in my devotional life? 
Pastor Andrew. That's a good question. Thank you for ever asked that. Well done. Um, well, that's, that's the issue for all of us, isn't it? It's how do I make the Bible come alive? And, and the reality is that as you look around the church world, you know, there, is, there seems to be a real lack of understanding of how to take the Bible and make it come alive. Um, and so we've become illiterate when it comes to the word. And it's a problem because David says that I've hid your word in my heart so I won't sin against you. And so when we go through temptations and challenges, if the word isn't there inside us, then we've got nothing to fall back on. It's like the man who built his house on the sand. When the storms come, you're going to fall over. But when the word's inside you, you'll be strong. So when it comes to devotions, um, I have one main Bible that I use. I think I said it's the NASB. And I have a couple of others that if you look at my study, I've got probably, I don't know, 10 to 15 different translations, but I have probably one, one main one and another two that I will then go to. And I try and mix up my, uh, my versions of, of Scripture because I don't want to get into a rut. And when you start reading out the same translation over and over and over again, you can preempt things because you know where it's going. You, it's already ingrained in your mind. So if you go to another translation, The Voice or NIV or Living Translation, it just brings a fresh view of what you've been reading. It'll be different words, different phrases. So I bear that in mind when you do your devotions. In my main Bible, I've got lots of notes. It's scribbled and crossed, and it's okay to do that in your Bible. You won't go to hell if you do that. I know it's sacred, but it's meant to be scribbled on. And that's a good thing and a bad thing, because when I go to the text and I'm reading, it reminds me of what God said before. And so, ah, I remember that. And that's a good thing. But the downside to that is I know where all the uh, scribble, scribbles and the writings are on my Bible as well. So I can go into that text with that in the back of my mind and not see fresh things. So that's why it's good to get a blank Bible with words on it and uh, and read it afresh because that gives you the ability for God to speak. So I interchange it. I hope that makes sense because you need both. Um, so that's what I do when it comes to reading the word. Um, the other thing that I would say is that as you do your devotions, memorization of scripture is a profound thing. In fact, I think it's Dallas Willard said it's one of the greatest spiritual disciplines is to memorize the word. Many of you know that the, the young Jewish uh, men and women, they could recite the Torah. I don't know how they did it, but they could recite it word for word because they'd hidden the word of God in their heart. It was just part of who they were. And, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, when the devil came against him, he didn't say, hang on a second, just let me pull out my scroll and find where it's written. He was able to come against the enemy with the word of God in his heart. And so um, I would encourage people just to uh, memorize the word. What Karen and I do, we have the Bible on um, on our phone, so we go to sleep listening to the Bible. Uh, what's his name? David Shusei. And, uh, and so we listen to that, and it's amazing, you know, that God will wake me up during the night, and so we play right through the Bible, and it'll be in a certain section where he'll wake me up, and he's been speaking to me about that very thing throughout the day. And so he wakes me up during different sections. So last night he woke me up in Revelation the night before, he woke me up in Ecclesiastes 3. And it's all about hearing. So God will use the word to speak to us. Remember, the, the Bible is a book of spiritual encounter. And so, uh, so as, I, as I do my devotions, I'm looking for entry points into an encounter with God. I'm not reading it just to read for, you know, get three chapters out of the way. I'm looking for the Holy Spirit to hover over a, over a scripture and breathe on it. And I go, there you go. That's my point in. And then I can sit on that, meditate on it. And, uh, and sometimes it'll take even a few days, a few weeks, and what I've been reading, God will just breathe on. So the Gospel calling to know, that book I wrote, I've been reading passages of Scripture, and I remember uh, I was at um, Ozone, Knox Ozone, sitting on a park bench, and I just had an encounter with God and a download, and the book came. But it had come from, from weeks and weeks of pressing into things, not quite knowing what it was. I knew there was something there. So in your devotions, as you press in, 
and you find little entry points and you may not understand it. So at the moment I'm reading the book of John and I know I'm onto something. I found something in that book about times and seasons. And if you read John, it's right through the, the book of John. Read hour, time, season. It's there. So I know I'm into something. I just haven't figured it out completely. So when it comes to your devotions, read through. It's not, a, it's not a quest to finish the Bible. You go to heaven even if you haven't read the whole thing. It's an invitation to encounter. Don't get guilty because you haven't read slabs. I'd, I'd rather be more concerned about have I encountered the Bible? Have I been transformed? It's a book. It's an invitation to transformation. So remember the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the... They, they, they knew the Bible so well they could get a, a scroll and they could put a pin through the scroll and they could tell you right through the scroll, which is in layers, they could tell you which words the pin had pierced as it went through the scroll. That means they knew their Bible pretty well. But when Jesus appeared, the one that they'd been waiting for and he stood right in front of them, they couldn't recognize him. Simeon and Anna, they held Jesus in their hands as a baby and they knew he was the son of God. Yeah. But these men that had been studying scripture, they didn't even know Jesus when he stood there. So it's not just about reading the Bible. It's about encountering the emotions of, of the God behind the Bible. And that's what the Bible, it's, a, it's an invitation to encounter God at a deep level. The other thing I'd say about scripture, and I, you know, we could talk about this for a long time, but Kenneth Hagin said, that when you read through the Bible, um, particularly for, for us as believers, we want to read through all the Bible, but particularly focus on the New Testament, the New Covenant, and particularly the, the Pauline epistles, and, and underline every time you see that phrase, in him, in whom, in Christ, all those phrases that talk about who we are in him, because that's what it's all about. It's about being in the Beloved. And underline those. So I would encourage you to read through Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, over and over and over again. You know, get one book and read through it over and over, like we've done with the book of John. Maybe do that with Ephesians. Yeah. Get it on CD, on phone, in your car and play it at night yeah. over and over and over and over and over again until it just becomes ingrained. Because he yeah. says if we, uh, his words abide in us and we abide in him. We'll ask what we will and it shall be done. So it's about getting that engrafted word yeah. deep inside, not just not just here, but it's when you become a living epistle and then you start people start reading you because mm. the word's alive in you. So so when it comes to devotions, get your Bible, your favorite Bible, underline it, read it, meditate on it, look for key phrases, um, and and God will begin to speak to you in a profound way. And I believe even today that God's presence is here yeah. Oh, yeah. and that, that he wants to break the lie. I felt this very strong that you can't understand the word. Yeah. The devil has lied to you, yeah. many of you and said it's too difficult. It's for these yeah. other people and it's too hard for you. But, but the word of God is uniquely written for you. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. It's his love letter for you. And so it can be understood. And here's the key. The key is spiritual hunger. That's the key to your devotional life. If you pray, and this is what I've done all my life, God, give me, thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. I need you to open my eyes to see. If I read it in my own ability, I won't get it. I need you to teach me. And if you hunger and you thirst, he will fill you and the word of God will come alive. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. It's breaking out of the analytical and getting into the spiritual in what's in the Bible and um, delving in instead of going slab by slab, getting that life. Yeah. Um, Pastor Dean, what are some good strategies to prevent the enemy from stealing what God is trying to say to me? Wow. That's yeah. a good question. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so probably one of the, I would say one of the best strategies is Paul says that we're not to be unaware of his snares, of the enemy's snares, doesn't he? So that's about being aware of the tactics of the enemy when it comes to whether you've listened to a message on a Sunday, whether you've done a, a, a read a scripture in the morning. Um, there, there, are, there are tactics from the enemy that come along to try to steal your revelation. And I guess the main um, 
scripture for that is in Mark chapter 4, mm. where it talks about the seed. And we, and we know that parable about how the farmer, who is Jesus, he sows a seed. And that seed's a revel- uh, it's a seed of revelation or God's word. So when you read God's word, he sows a seed in you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He sows a seed in your heart. And there's four different, I guess, um, there's four different soils that he talks about or grounds. And, uh, and three, of the, three of the hearts, three of the pictures of the hearts, um, they lose the seed. And that's because the enemy comes along and steals it. Mm. Firstly, it's the hard heart. It's the pavement. Um, secondly, it's the, the trials that come. The, the, it's interesting Jesus says that persecution comes for the word's sake. So that tells me that the enemy comes along to steal the seed, but God can actually use the trial or persecution to strengthen that, his word within you. So that's really important to understand. Um, so the first thing is a hard heart. The second thing is trials and persecutions that the en- enemy uses. And, um, and the third is the, the, the thorns which choke the, the weeds which grow up and choke the seed. And that's a, a picture of the worries of life and the lusts of the world. Yeah. So when we think we're pursuing money, we're pursuing our job, we're pursuing everything else but God, then uh, you're going to lose your seed. The yeah. enemy uses those to steal your, your revelation from you. Yeah. Um, and so it's being aware of that, mm. being aware of that. Of when a trial comes on, see, if you get, uh, I've had this a lot, people get a revelation on healing or they get a revelation on, you know, finances, whatever it is. And then during that week, that month, they'll, the persecution will come. Yeah. There'll be a big, um, you know, there'll be a, the, the enemy will wage war and it's him waging war over that seed. He wants to see, do you really get this? Mm. It, can I steal this from you? And that's what he wants to do. So you just got to be aware of that. It's being aware of what the enemy does. Um, we're in a spiritual war. Mm. So you got to be aware of that. And it's the, the soft and tender heart, wasn't it? that receives the seed and what does it produce 30 60 100 fold yeah. so it's a picture of revelation it's a picture of the, what the revelation produces in us is it gives us abundant life in those yeah. areas and so that's important is that when i've heard a message um, on a sunday or when i'm just reading scripture in the morning is that i stay soft i stay teachable mm. if yeah. i've got a hard heart if i'm unteachable if i've if i'm angry at god or if there's areas in, in my attitudes where I'm not happy with God, where I'm in unbelief, yeah. then the enemy is going to steal the seed that God plants within yeah. me. And so it's about being aware of that, having a soft and humble heart, and also staying in the realm of faith. That's really important, <laughs> is that we stay in that area of faith because the enemy wants to get you in unbelief. So I receive the word, and then I stay in faith in that word. So I receive yeah. the word on uh, prosperity, and I stay in faith that even though maybe I'm going through a, a struggling time, I'm going to keep that word within That's me. It. Let it dwell within me richly. That's what the Apostle Paul says. That's it. And it's keeping, so. you, it's keeping yourself protected as well. Yeah. So when you get the revelation, it's no surprise when the attack That's right. comes. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Dean. Very good, Dean. Very good. We've got a controversial question. Only slightly. Is there any reason to read the Old Testament now that we've got the New Testament. Your thoughts, Pastor Andrew? Yes. (laughs) With a clause. The, The Bible, as you know, is made up of 66 books, correct? And you know the, the story of the lampstand in the holy place. It had seven branches with 66 buds on the branches. On the left side, the left three branches, plus the centre branch, which is a picture of Christ, the centre branch. So the left three branches in the centre make up 39 buds, which is a picture of the Old Testament. And on the right side of the lampstand, the three branches are 27 buds which represent the New Testament. So Christ is the bridge between the old and the new. So we say to people that in the old you've got the new concealed and in the new you've got the old revealed. And so the, in the Old Testament, so Christ is in, the, in both the old and the new. So in the old, he's there in a shadow. So for instance, in, in Numbers, you've got the serpent. Remember the story where the Israelites were dying and being bitten by snakes and so the answer is to get a snake, put it on a pole, and the, and, and the, the snake is like a, a picture of the serpent. And uh, whoever looked to the, the snake, they will live, and they are delivered from the snake bite. 
So it's a picture of Jesus on the cross, and the New Testament unpacks that. So Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he talks to his disciples and reveals who he is by unpacking the Old Testament, saying, I was always in there, I was hidden in there. So absolutely, the Old Testament is a profound um, journey for us to take. As we read through it, we see Jesus in every book of the Old Testament. He's there um, in all his glory. You just have eyes to see. So the, the key to re reading a book like Leviticus, how many people enjoy Leviticus? Well, we should because it's one of those buds. And in Leviticus, Jesus is so profoundly revealed. Again, if you read uh, commentaries like um, A.W. Pink, you begin to see the analogies and the pictures of, um, of what Jesus did on the cross. It's, it's quite profound and it, it gives us revelation. So I say to people in the Old Testament, you see the kingdom of God physically. You see the effects of the kingdom so in, in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you see what it looks like to be blessed by God. You see it all around. They sow and they reap. In the new covenant, we see what it looks like on the inside. It's an internal kingdom. So the Jews were looking for Jesus to come and bring victory externally. But the reality was the kingdom begins inside. So the old covenant is showing us what it looks like when we get the inside right. When I... When I let him reign on the inside, all my outer world will come into alignment. So I look to the Old Covenant for a picture of what it means when I've got my inside right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the Old Testament should be read and it should be embraced, absolutely. Um, now in saying that, because I said yet yeah, with a clause, that Paul says that we go from glory to glory. There was a glory of the Old Covenant, but it was a passing glory. And one of the purposes of the Old Covenant was to bring us to a point where we said this one word, help. I can't do it. It's impossible. It's too hard. And so the glory of the Old Covenant was to make us realize how much we need a saviour, how, how, how desperate we are without Jesus. That's a wonderful glory, but it's a passing glory. The far surpassing glory of the New Covenant is what Jesus has done for us. So... I say to people, when you read the old and the new, you've got to put them rightly together. So many people butcher the covenants. Well-meaning people, great people, great leaders. And this is just my opinion. And you don't have to agree with me, but you don't have to be right either. <laughs> it's a joke. But when you read the covenants, you need to understand how they work together. The cross changed everything. The cross brought about a new covenant. So when you read the Gospels... You know, I, I was talking to the guys in the office because we like to throw out little questions, you know, to test each other. And I said, all right, when do the disciples get born again? Well, the answer is at the end of John. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. They weren't born again in the Lord's Prayer. So we read the Lord's Prayer as if it's the greatest prayer that we can pray. It's an old covenant prayer. The great prayers we pray are the Pauline prayers remember Paul's writings are actually Jesus writings okay they're not Paul's they're Jesus he got them by revelation Jesus uh, said it Paul dictated it. he wrote it down it was Jesus writings and so these are the things that we couldn't bear in the old covenant so when you read the gospels uh, Matthew uh, chapter 11 verse 12 says that the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force so in the gospels the kingdom's been ushered in but it's not quite there yet so the Gentiles are beginning to get access to things that don't belong to them, like the Samaritan woman at the well. She shouldn't have got that. Jesus came for the Jews. Like the, the whole thing, at the, the water at the well, sorry, um, the wine at the, um, in, in the wedding in John chapter 2. It was before time. It was out of season. So when you read the, the Gospels, you need to understand the, the picture between the old, the transition, and the new covenant. Everything changes at the cross. Yeah. I'll give you an example. The Jesus' prayer, uh, the Lord's prayer that we call it, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And we've heard this taught that if you don't forgive, then God won't forgive you. That's old covenant. Yeah. It's old covenant. The cross changes it. Forgiveness is about a debt owed. Colossians 2 says that all our debts were cancelled at the cross. Everything that was held against us was put 
was taken out. Jesus said, it is finished at the cross. And that word finished is the debt has been paid in full. Forgiveness is about a debt. It was taken care of at the cross. So people preach that if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. Really? We're all in big trouble. See, the new covenant says forgive as Christ has forgiven you. So Christ comes and forgives a broken heart. I don't have the capacity to forgive people without his forgiveness in my life. I need his life in me. So Jesus was, was raising the bar in the Gospels to prove to every religious person that we can't do it. It wasn't a prayer to live up to. It wasn't. You try it. You try earning God's approval by you having... So it's all about what you do. Then God will do something. You step up to the mark, then God will fulfill it. But after the cross, it all reverses. It's about it's been done. Now you can do it. I've healed you. Now you go and heal someone else. I've forgiven you. Now you have my love inside you. And now you're able to forgive other people. Now I've empowered you. You've been loved so much. Now it flows. And so when you read the old and the new, you've got to put them rightly together. As you read Jesus and he's teaching, he's revealing the kingdom. He's ushering in a new kingdom. He's getting us ready for the greatest covenant. It's a fast surpassing covenant. So in Hebrews, it says, all our sins have been forgiven. You've been made perfect. Perfect. Colossians says, all your sins are forgiven. And so when we come into this new covenant, we've got to read it with the eyes and the lens of grace. So when you say, should I read the old or the new? Read them both, but read them the way they designed. The old brings us to a point where we receive the, the Savior on the cross. And after we receive him, we enter into a new covenant. And it's based on better promises. Isn't that oh, an yeah. um, amazing thing? That's amazing. And so when you read, read both, read them in context. When you read the Gospels, ask yourself, who is Jesus talking to what is the context if you don't you're going to butcher it you're going to put yourself under condemnation you're going to pull out your eye you're going to cut off your arm you're going to you're going to lust you know have have a lust you see a picture in in the paper and there's a little thought of lust well i'm just as bad as an adulterer now you get angry with someone now i may as well just be a murderer Mm -hmm. now jesus jesus was doing something he was ramping up the bar because because his righteousness is perfect yeah. He fulfilled all that. Yeah. And so when I read his writings, I'm understanding what's the covenant, who is he talking to. And so when you hear teaching, filter it through the lens of the new covenant. That's right. And the new covenant doesn't, doesn't now mean that we're all going to sin. It empowers us not to sin. It empowers yeah. us to love. So it's true. about our new standing in Christ. So, so for that question, do I read the old or the new? Read both, but primarily read the new because that's your state. Read the old to see where you've come yeah. from, who Christ is, but read the, the new for your new found position. Read the Gospels to understand the kingdom. That's awesome. That's how I look at it. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Dean? Yeah, I'll add to that quickly. Yeah. Um, just you, and I teach my youth this as well, so hopefully they remember this. But uh, you can't, under for, for us today... Uh, you can't understand the old co- the the Old Testament properly unless you fully understand the New Covenant. Yeah. So unless you understand why Jesus came, unless you understand grace and sonship, and so what we have in in a lot of the church is we have people who don't fully understand grace. They don't fully understand the whole work of Jesus at the cross, what he's done, and Paul unpacks that in all his New Testament letters. Oh. They don't fully understand that. So when they teach from the Old Testament. You see that they teach with a language where it's not really sonship. They teach in a language where they take the, they, they misunderstand the heart behind God, behind the Father in the Old Testament, because he still had, he was still full of grace. You can still find a lot of grace in the Old Testament, and they take that and then it, it, it kind of, um, it, they skew the new covenant with that. They they don't get it right, and so that's important to understand is that we get the new covenant right. We understand fully who Jesus is. Um, We understand identity and what what Paul, everything that the Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter and John, what they taught about uh, with the Holy Spirit speaking through them. We take that and then we go to the Old Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we can understand that a lot better. Um, So that's important. Yeah, That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Question for you, Dean. 
what role does the Holy Spirit have when I'm reading my Bible? That's good, yeah. He has a, he has a, a huge role. The Holy Spirit is the most important person in the Trinity when I'm reading my Bible. Because, um, well, firstly, he brings life to the Word, doesn't he? So, the Bible is the Word of God, but it's the Holy Spirit who brings life to it. So, if you think Andrew said that before with the, with the Pharisees, they miss Jesus. Jesus said to them in John chapter 5, I think it is, you, you know, you search the Scriptures. So, they knew scriptures so well better better than any of us they knew the old testament so you know the law and the prophets and the narratives they knew all that better than anyone you search the scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life but the scriptures are the ones which point to me to jesus and you're not willing to come to jesus so they're saying that jesus is saying the word of god is amazing but we need the holy spirit he brings life to it so he brings eternal life to the word so that's his role. When I first come to read the Word, I say, Holy Spirit, make this come alive to me today. Feed me with it because it's food. Jesus said the Word of God feeds us. Um, secondly, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that he's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So if I want to get wisdom and revelation out of the Word, then I need the Holy Spirit. So you, need, you need the Holy Spirit for wisdom and revelation. People think, oh, well, imagine the Pharisees. They thought they were the wisest people on earth, didn't they? But they weren't. They missed Jesus. How, how unwise could you get? You got the living God standing in front of you doing all these miracles and you miss him. And that's because they didn't get wisdom and revelation from the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's the second point is that he, he reveals the mysteries of the kingdom to you. There's things you can never understand unless you get revelation from the Holy Spirit. Because when you're reading scripture, it, it says that he searches the heart of the Father and then he speaks to your spirit. And then it comes up into your mind, into your soul. So we need him for our wisdom and revelation. Um, and that's second of all. And thirdly, um, on that, I would say that he, he leads us into all truth. So Jesus talks about that in, in John chapter 14, 15 and 16. That's one of his primary roles. And what's the difference with that? Well, you think when you're approaching scripture, um, there's a lot. Everyone, no one, no one believes God perfectly. No one has perfect theology except God. So that means everyone in this room, everyone listening on live stream, sorry, but you're all believing a lie somewhere. <laughs> what? You've all, yeah. You've all, Jesus talks about it as like a veil. So there's, there can be darkness in our thinking. And that darkness, it's not like a, a sinful thing. It's not a, you know, it's just a, it's like an unfruitfulness in your mind. There's things, there's things in you that are veiled that, that, you know, Holy Spirit just wants to lift the veil. And they're the lies of the enemy. He says his lies bring a veil upon our heart. So we don't see God properly. We don't see ourselves properly. We don't see the situations, the problems we're going through properly. There's always um, another revelation yeah. that is there. That's right. So, so I would say that he leads you into all truth. So that's what I do is when I go to read the word, read a scripture, or when I'm listening to Pastor Andrew preach or anyone else preach, I'm saying, I'm, I'm literally thinking Holy Spirit and I'm talking to him, lead me into all truth here. Get rid of the lies in my thinking, in my believing, and lead me in the truth. So they're the three things um, that I would say that he does. Yeah, That's awesome. But Last question. What's the best way to study the Word in order to receive revelation from God in relation to what you read? And how do I get key principles and revelation from a verse? Mm. My favourite thing. Well, as Dean said... Holy Spirit is is the master key to all this. He's the one that will teach us. In saying that, I approach the Bible like a detective. I'm asking questions, why? Why did you do that? So I'll give an example. I think I've got this in one of my books about Hagar and her son. Do you remember when she's... Um, She's going to die and so she leaves the son under a tree and she goes 100 metres down the road and she starts crying and the son starts crying. And the Bible says, and the Lord, or the angel, heard the boy. And I read that and I thought, that's not right. Why would he hear the boy and not the woman? And that set me off in a, a journey of discovery that, that there are times that God doesn't hear us when we separate ourselves from the promise, the boy's the promise. Yeah. 
So it was an invitation for the woman to get back to the boy because God is with the boy. He's not, not in our pain, he's in our promise. And often we go to our pain where God's drawing us to the promise. And so as I read that, I thought, ah, oh, it's when she goes back to the boy and picks the boy up, she sees her provision. So we can't see our provision when we're moping in our pain. We have to hold the promise. Then, then our eyes are open. Now that, all, that whole revelation unpacked the whole message, but it came about by asking a question. Why? It's not logical. So we read that, we uh, boy, and we just skip over it. And there's like lights going off. Wah! Stop, stop. There's a revelation here. And it's when we go too fast and we read things that don't make sense and we don't stop and say, why? And sometimes you, you can ask Karen, I'll walk around around circles in the house, muttering to myself, trying to work out why. I'll go back and read it again, pray in the spirit, walk around circles. And then I'll have this aha moment when it comes alive. That's why. Now, that's how I approach, you know, the question was devotions and how to receive from God. It's by asking questions, simple questions, and God will answer us. Now, I never in a million years would have figured that out myself. It needed to be a re revelation from God. But that one moment not only served to be a blessing to others, you know, I've had people pick up that book who've gone through so much pain, lost children, lost all sorts of things, things people close to them. And that, that was a word in season from because I stopped and asked a question. And the Holy Spirit will make it come alive. So I'm looking for things that don't make sense. I'm looking for things that repeat themselves. For an, so an example, in John 5, the man has been sick, uh, an invalid for 38 years. So whenever you read that, it's not just some random number. God doesn't just throw out a number. It's an invitation to find out where that occurred. So we know in Deuteronomy 2, children of Israel were stuck at Kadesh Barnea for 38 years, going around, around in circles. And God spoke to them and said, rise up. So it's interesting, Jesus says to the man, get up. So it's a picture. The, he is a picture of what Jesus is saying to all of Israel. All right? So we're connecting the dots. You go, well, I, I can't do that. Well, have you got a computer? You can type in 38 in your Bible, and it'll take you back to all the 38s. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's where it occurred, the law of first mention. So when I read the number 13, I was reading it in context to, to a story, and I thought, well, what does 13 mean? So I went back and I looked, where did 13 happen first? And it's a picture of rebellion. It's when the kings rebelled. All right, so I know whenever I see 13 in Scripture, it's a picture of rebellion. So I'm looking for all those things. I'm looking for numbers. I'm looking for colors. They are all, see, God speaks at multiple levels. We have an English language, but God, you know, when you get the Hebrew letter, it has a number attached to it. It has, each character has a, has a meaning. Often it would be like a camel or a hook. And so when you read Psalm 119, that's, that's literally the Hebrew alphabet. And so each letter has a meaning and it then unpacks the next seven or eight verses. So you can go and buy books that unpack all the Hebrew meanings, Hebrew letters. It's, it's amazing. So when I read that story of 153 fish in the book of John in the last chapter, then I found out that 153 in Hebrew mean, is, is the number for the phrase sons of God. So, okay, now it makes sense. So whenever you see those numbers... Don't just say, oh, whatever. No, there's something behind it. Find it. The Bible is in multiple layers. The Jews said that there were four different layers of revelation. So it can mean this, and it can mean that, and it can mean something else underneath. So whenever I'm reading, I'm looking for what no one else can see. I'm not trying to make it up. But I'm looking for the layers of revelation. So Mark 4, as Dean said, there are multiple levels, levels of revelation there that you can unpack. And you get that and you come back again and there's another level. And do you know what? I reckon, I believe with God, there's so many levels of revelation that you'll never exhaust it. It's, that's the way the word, it's a living, breathing word. It's, it's living, it's alive. So we engage with it and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts unpacking it. I don't know about you, but when I get a revelation from God, I start dancing. 
I, I can't. It's like it's the biggest drug. It's it's like it's the biggest fix. It's like every part of me comes alive, and I just feel like shouting to the whole world, "Look what I found!" <laughs> it's the pearl of great price. It's yeah. I, I I wouldn't trade anything for it. And with that one revelation. It can bring breakthrough in multiple areas of my life. Because yeah. if, if you can see it, you can have it. Yeah. That's how the kingdom works. When, once you see something in the Bible, it's yours. Mm. If you can't see it, you can't have it. Yeah. That's how it works. So the moment you see it, it's done. So that revelation about Hagar and the son, that's mine now. I, mm. It can never be taken from me. Yeah. So every time I go, get into pain, I know that I just go across to my promise and hold it and provision will come. That's good. That's awesome. Think about that. For the rest of my life, I have a key that opens a door in any time of pain. Yeah. So how profound. So that's, as I'm reading through, I'm looking for numbers, I'm looking for colours, I'm looking for where's this been mentioned before. So as I said, you, uh, in John 5, I'm looking at the moment at, at seasons and times and hours. So while that's on my mind, I'll show you how it works. The Bible's playing at night, I wake up, Ecclesiastes 3 of all places. Yeah. Now, if you know that chapter, it's a whole chapter. Ecclesiastes 3 gives us 28 seasons. Okay, that's how it works. 28 is the number of seasons, 28 days in a lunar calendar. And isn't it interesting that, that God's speaking to me leading up to my birthday about seasons and time, and, and he wakes me up in Ecclesiastes 3, which has 28 seasons. And so you will see these patterns flow over and over again as you delve into de your devotional life. And what will happen is that God will set up, uh, Karen's amazing at this, God sets up riddles in your devotional life that only you can solve. He, it, it will be numbers, it will be things externally that will match what you're reading in the Word. And it will all come together and you'll think you're being weird, but it's God setting up because the language of the kingdom isn't like our language. So the more you pray in the spirit, the more, the more you open up the language of the kingdom, which is colours, numbers, unusual events, all sorts of things. You'll take the paper, you'll take the news, and you'll weave it all together, and he'll, he'll come into your devotional life, and he'll give you a key that you can do life with. So that's how I do my devotional life. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Who wants to receive this morning? We really believe that um, from what's been shared that there is a great opportunity, there's a great wealth of knowledge and insight that's within the Bible that is available for you today, right now. As we were saying, as Pastor Andrew was saying earlier, there are so many lies that we believe of ourselves that we can't read the Bible, that we can't understand what's in there. It's a gift given by Jesus to us so that we can understand the kingdom more. So we want to take this opportunity right now to, to invite you into an opportunity of response. Yeah. Pastor Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. We felt as we were preparing for today that, that God was going to release an anointing upon you. And there is a transference of anointing, you know, Paul with Timothy, and we see it right through Scripture, that will unlock, firstly, a, a deep hunger for the Word of God. Secondly, that will break the lies over your life and over mine that says we can't do it. Yeah. That it's not, this is not for me. This is not, not my Bible. This is for someone else to unpack for me. Yeah. Thirdly, we're going to pray that, that as you read the Word, you are going to go into deep, deep personal encounters with God that will transform the way you relate to the Father and the Son, that will give you keys for your life, for your breakthrough. See, God... God's really deeply concerned about all the affairs of your life. He has answers to your workplace. Some of you have come today, you've got problems that need to be solved in your workplace. You've got relational problems that need to be solved. And in the Word of God, God's going to speak to you and unpack all the keys for your victory. And so we wanted to offer to you today prayer that we could believe with you, yeah. that you could step into a new realm. Yeah of receiving from the manna from God. It's yeah. manna from heaven. It's, yeah. it's what sustains us, what brings us alive. It's his love letter to us. It's him deeply encountering spirit to spirit. His words are spirit and they are life. Yeah. 
And as you leave this place today and you open up the word, it's going to come alive. The yeah. word of the Lord, it, you'll begin to tremble at the word of the Lord. It'll be like a fire in your bones. It yeah. will burn. You'll wake up and the scriptures will be alive inside you and, and it'll propel you and it'll do something profound within you. Yeah. And we break the religious lie yeah. that's come against some of you that says you can't believe. Yeah that you've treated the word just like a fairy tale yeah. or like a storybook and not like God's love language to you. Yeah. And so we break that lie. Yeah. And as we pray for you today, things are going to change when it comes to the living word of God for yeah. you. So what we're going to ask in a moment is, is if that's your prayer today, the, in a moment I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to pray for you. And uh, some of you today are going to receive prophetic words that God's going to speak to you and unlock things in your life. And so as we respond to the Lord, He's going to meet us at our deepest heart cry. And I truly believe that as we leave today, something's going to change in our relationship with the Lord at a deep, deep level.